tie off a little bit, chill out and relax. Uh, we're going to throw out some questions. Uh, if you're familiar with Behind the uh, Actor Studio, that TV show, it's going to be a little bit similar. And let's hear uh, what they have to say. Uh, the, the topic in particular will be uh, 1995 and beyond, what could have happened, and let's roll. Dan? So, the premise of, the, of this uh, topic you know, came about, James and I were trying to figure out um, a panel that would be fun for you know, people who've been here years and years, and also people who, maybe this is your first joke on. And you know, being the last time, we wanted to pick a topic that would be interesting enough to really covering, we thought who else would be good to talk about it other than the gentlemen who were on the brand at that time. So um, so we're going to talk a little bit about, I'm going to let them talk more about what was to come. We have a lot of imagery. Uh, bear with us if we jump around because we want to really follow their lead as far as if they're talking about a certain topic, uh, we can jump to that uh, slide per se. So, um, so go ahead and start the slideshow if you could. Price points 
So um, a couple of price points we were asked uh, to go um, to $799. Um, and I can't, I think it's where I have the 300. That was how many units we thought we were going to sell. So originally the item was going to sell for $699. And we were going to do 350,000 pieces at $699. Well, you don't just change a price point and expect to do the same volume. Right? If you change the price point, you take the price point up by a buck, you're not going to sell 350000 You're going to sell less. Okay, so I, in my head, dropped the forecast down to three hundred, And then, because uh, that's what marketing does, you know, we try to predict how many of each item we're going to sell. Um, and then uh, on the uh, Cobra Interceptor, um, R&D had planned to, to um, produce a really cool toy. I can't even remember what the toy was. But, um, you know, it was going to sell for $29.99. And in this particular meeting, um, you know, someone said, and it might have been somebody in sales, someone said, we can't sell that for $29.99. you got to try and sell that at $16.99 to $18.99. So my note here is, um, can we do it? So can we cost the item in such a way, which means to these guys, what do we have to take out of the product to drop it in price from $29.99 down to affordable price of $16.99. That means take stuff out. So they don't like to hear that. <laughs> no designer does. Yeah, that wasn't direction, that was just a suggestion, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so here's just a snapshot real quick of 1995, and we'll come back to X soldiers but I wanted to show um, that that was something that was discussed and planned uh, for 95. Yeah, this that was, go back to that in just a second. Um, <laughs> The, the overall strategy, once we started um, in 1992 or three, the overall strategy that I laid out for the G.I. Joe team was, um, G.I. Joe should mean all things to all boys. There should never be a boys action figure concept that gets released into the marketplace that G.I. Joe doesn't decide to attack and get a piece of. So we should never let another brand like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles or another brand like Mighty Morphin Power Rangers ever get a foothold in the boys' toys action marketplace. There's no excuse for that. And so what we did is we started anticipating what companies were going to be doing. And so we would read a lot of the toy trades. We, uh, at the time, Wizard Publications was big and you know would uh, scope out not just talking about comic books, but talking about upcoming movies. So I was constantly reading that to see what was going on and what was happening. And we always wanted to maintain a military presence, and that's what Battleport became. But we had heard that Kenner was going to be coming out with Star Wars. This is in 1992 or three, And we decided we're not going to let Kenner come out with Star Wars without us having some preemptive response. That became Star Brigade. Okay? And Kenner never released Star Wars, by the way. Okay, that early in the, in the 90s. Um, Sergeant Savage, we had heard that, that Mattel had the license for Sergeant Rock, and guess what? Joe Kubert wasn't gonna have a part in that movie. Okay, now how do you take the man most responsible for creating the best-selling war comic ever produced and not have him on board as a technical advisor? So I had heard Joe was miffed by that, so I picked up the phone and I called Joe Hubert and I said, we have an idea, and because Kurt had been a recent graduate of the Kubert School of Art, um, we got to Joe Hubert and we made him put a proposal together, and together we created Sergeant Savage, um, which was our attempt to blunt anything that Mattel was going to do. And, and Mortal Kombat was, you know, a, another extension of what we had done with Street Fighter, okay? It made sense to incorporate, uh, we have a lot of ninjas in G.I. Joe, why not combine a ninja movie and video game into G.I. Joe? Um, Ex-Soldiers, um, which uh, Kurt's going to show you some examples of, was just far out crazy thinking, but Marvel superheroes had all of a sudden become a big selling line of action figures, okay, with Toy Biz, and they had introduced, obviously, their X-Men and all their Marvel characters slowly. So I said, why should we let Marvel get another uh, toehold in the boys' toys action business? Why don't we create our own super soldiers? And that became X-Soldiers. 
and then obviously Hall of Fame, which was our 12-inch characters. So, I mean, together, you know, my job was to provide the overall vision. These guys' job, their job was to interpret that vision. And obviously, they did a great job. You're gonna still, trust me, you're gonna see some artwork in a few minutes. <laughs> Breaking out of the, of the 1994 season, Mr. Kirk and I were just talking, you know, you can see some things were planned for July 94 for the Manimals and then the Inceptor as well, but then those got pushed back. And then, like you said, July, August 94 is when we learned that the Real American Hero line was uh, no longer Yeah, it was, it was mid, mid August we were, we were all told that uh, G.I. Joe was moving to Kenner, that we no longer had, we we're going to be responsible for developing G.I. Joe. Um, but this, what Dan's trying to show you is we had plans for all of this, 94 and 95. Um, this is a, um, a rough, uh, well, actually it's a pre-toy fair um, sheet. This would have been shown and given to our key buyers, the retail buyers who would come to Hasbro. They would come in uh, anywhere between May and June, uh, late June they would come to preview our next year's product line. So this would have been shown to them in probably May, but this is for 1995 pre-toy fair, uh, which usually occurs in the fall of, of the year. Um, and so here you see, and this is only one section of it, but here you see <coughs> what we were planning to do for Battle Corps and Star Brigade, and then some of my notes. Um, these were notes because we had just shown this concept to Target so these were the uh, retail buyers' <coughs> comments about our line that I jotted down uh, from his uh, comments about what he saw in, in, in terms of the line. And the thing that I found most amusing is we had shown a, uh, uh, a free Manimals video. In other words, you're gonna buy Manimals, you're gonna get a free videotape, okay? And this buyer uh, had just transferred over from buying video, um, uh, the, you know, video VHS, okay, videotapes. He had just transferred over from being the buyer of videotapes to now becoming the toy buyer. And he didn't get the idea that you're buying the toy and the video's free, because he came from the world of you buy the video and the toy is free, okay? So that, the comment if you see there is, you know, with Manimals, he just didn't get the whole idea, it was like, 180 degrees uh, opposite of what he was used to buying. So that's just a little insight into some of the uh, forms and, and uh, things we had to do. And then this was um, just, a, you know, you're not gonna be able to read all of that, but, but this was an analysis that, um, that uh, Vinny DeLeva, who was my marketing director at the time, pulled together for um, how the brand had grown over the years. Uh, the number of items that we did each year. So you see in 91, uh, it's almost like a bar graph, if you will, an upside down bar graph of how the line grew. And you see in 1993, uh, how extensive the brand was. 94, we scaled back a little bit. 95 looks like we scaled it way back, uh, but that's not really true because what that's not showing is um, some of the other ideas that we had planned. So this, as I said to Dan earlier, this was probably uh, again, a pre-toy fair analysis. So it doesn't show everything that we had planned for 95, but all of that is because we weren't developing 95 after August of 94, so. So again, you know, with this, what I found interesting, there are a few things on here that we'll get into. The, the some things that we've actually heard about as far as the Sea Wolf, which is gonna be a repaint of the whale that was gonna come out for about four rangers. The Bell Platform, which was gonna come out you know, the one thing I noticed recently on here was the Torres Arrest Command Center, which I've asked these guys, you know, a lot of questions about. Do you recall anything about that? Maybe we can talk yeah, about um, I don't know if it's working. Yeah. Um, the Command Center, and I could be completely wrong, but um, we had, uh, you know, we had created the folding out um, headquarters, and I was asked to take off the two side panels, um, take out the front drawer, and create an inexpensive headquarters. And I believe, I know that I painted one up and it was presented, I'm, I'm pretty sure that that's what it was presented for. Uh, never came out, obviously, and I don't have any images of it, but uh, yeah, it existed, it's probably somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
And you know, I think what's interesting at this time is the you know most of us have only heard about. I mean, you've seen maybe M3 of mammals and you know wave one, wave two, maybe the mammal encounter. You see a current example. But I think seeing these plans, it shows like mammals and space and what's going to be a very huge focus at that time for Joe. So it's always interesting to see where that's heading. But before we get into that, um, you guys want to talk a little bit about? So we'll start with that. <laughs> And you, know, you can expand on why the range of that, and then also where you guys were heading with the brand at this time with the look of the brand. Yeah, before you get to that, um, exactly. Yeah, far, far right to me. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, what the plan was on all of this was that we had a lot of different segments. Whatever worked, whatever sold in the marketplace, we were going with the big one. And if we didn't, we would either slow down just a little bit or cut it out to the end So that was really the plan. Um, so we were going to try some stuff, and we were going to try to blunt other people's um, attacks on the boys' on. So that's the reason that we were doing it. Because that's a question that I've been asked is why were we were doing all these things. So blunt some attacks, pass some stuff out, see what works, to make it work better. Um, and we would have made big whatever worked the best. You guys want to expand on Battle for Rangers as far as some of these designs and then also the, the one on the right is really cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I had nothing to do with this. This was Dave DeFord. I think Dave DeFord did the design work for this. So as far as so we've always heard that the line was moving. So this would be like the core battle for Yeah, this would have been the, this would have been the more traditional G.I. Joe military force. Yeah, you saw that it was going to have like two figures on the list. That just meant two new. All the rest were going to be existing Frankenstein, whatever it was. But that was the new stuff. And that the Baroness in that in that uh, picture was based off my secretary. <laughs> <laughs> Here are some different vehicles. The uh, Phantom tank on the bottom did eventually um, become the tank that was released for Savage, but early on it was made for Battle for Rangers. Today, uh, in, uh, in my booth, or declassified, some of this stuff will be shown as far as preliminary castings of some of the vehicles. And there's the battle station uh, that we mentioned, and then the Sea Wolf. Uh, the far up the right hand corner is something called the Man of War, and uh, that's a very uh, early concept of it. Um, it's on its way here, but I'll, be, I'll have a casting of this at the classified booth um, either later today or tomorrow of uh, the Man of War and some of you'll see the changes from this to what was expected or um, what was to come of it eventually. So Ninja Commando uh, was an extension of the Ninja Force. Kurt, did you work on those? Um, all I don't know now is just putting uh, some slides together. Okay. <coughs> they did the design. They did the design. Kirk, do you want to talk anything for No, other than that was just, you know, again, you're trying, you had a successful brand uh, Ninja Force, and so it was just another <coughs> way to continue to expand in that whole world of Ninja. So, you know, we figured we'd, you know, come up with another new name, Ninja Commandos, and um, those are some of the designs for, the, for them, obviously. Are you should sure? talk about it a little bit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so these are the techno walkers, and the idea was you'd have the wind-up mechanism inside. Um, the whole time we were trying to actually put a thumb wheel uh, on it, but uh, so that'd be very difficult for a child to, you know, to push. So we went back to the basic. But the idea was to have it so this thing could actually move, walk, and we were trying to figure out how to make the um, weapon fire at the end, so it would stop and fire. We never did uh, figure that out, well, but they did walk. It actually was really fun for them. I think they still walk. Right? Yeah. This was from the era, just so you understand, this was from the era of, um, uh, G.I. Joe had a major change in, in terms of focus between 1989 and 1990 that then went for the next you know, four years. The focus was, um, how do we make good toys? Um, you know, you say to yourself, well, all G.I. Joe product were toys. Well, yeah, they were, but 
by 1989, those toys were being that of GI Joe uh, were basically model kits. They were great looking model kits. They went together well, but what did they do? Okay, they rolled. They had guns that moved up and down or, or around. Um, but beyond that, they were pretty static playthings. Um, so starting around 1990, we started incorporating toy features into everything we did. Whether it was you know the shooting mechanisms, which was the first thing that we did, um, to as you know Kurt was just saying, you know, okay, how, how can we make a GI Joe walk? Well, you couldn't do it with a three and three quarter inch figure, but you could do it in an exosuit like that. And so we started to incorporate. And if you look at those products from 1990 to 1994, every single one of those toys had a quote toy feature. Uh, I coined the term toy eyes, the line, okay? And, and so every one of those products has some kind of unique toy feature, whether it's squirt gun features, uh, all of a sudden we had G.I. Joe's that could fly, uh, we were incorporating wind-up mechanisms, a lot of um, different shooting mechanisms, we had battery-operated toys, we had a remote-controlled Jeep, that was stuff that wasn't being done prior to 1989. So there was a big shift in gears. <laughs> well, that's black. Just real quick, one thing Kirk did say earlier, you got to get cost amount of five. Those wind-up figures are a good example. They were originally were designed to be in a separate exosuit that you could put the figure in. Problems we ran into, one, how do you make these legs walk? Because now the G.I. Joes have very stiff legs. The second was the, the weight of the G.I. Joe itself on top of the walking mechanism. <laughs> didn't work real well. So it just kept going down to that. Finally, it just was a walking figure, but it was a good example of how the idea started here at point A and finally got to its final point by C, D, F, you know. Somewhere along the line, we said, this is what we need to do to make it work. It was Colton that asked you when, you were, when he was little, he brought home an item that said, yeah, that's an said iconic, Daddy, what, what did it do? Yeah, that's an iconic story. Mm -hmm. um, my son, I was at a Kmart getting tires put on my car and I took him inside the, to the toy department. And he was like four years old and uh, I tried to get him to buy an 87 cent Hot Wheel car uh, instead of a 3.99 Ninja Turtle. And uh, so when I gave him the Hot Wheel car, I said, hey, how, how'd you like to have this little Corvette? And he said, he looked at it and he looked at me and he said, what does it do? And it hit me. He's right. The only thing a Hot Wheel car does is roll. And I said that to him. I said, "Well, it rolls." And he just put it down. He didn't even want to. <laughs> he didn't even want to touch it. So I went into work the following week, and I think this was on Saturday. I went into work on Monday, and I had just come back onto Boys Toys, and I said, "We got a problem, guys. Take a look at every one of our products and ask yourself." What does it do? And the answer was, it rolls. It has guns that move. But beyond that, they didn't do much of anything. And uh, that was what the impetus was to change and quote, toy eyes the line. Yeah, to add to that actually, and it's something that I brought through my toy career after we started toy eyes and stuff. Um, and I was, I was paying attention to what kids were buying on the shelf, and especially the figures. And they, you know, we would reissue the same guy, Duke you know, came out, and then Duke came out. Um, and I was watching a lot of the Marvel stuff where it was, you know, Spider-Man came out, and Spider-Man came out. And the kid would come down the aisle, and whether, when, it, when he came to like a Duke that he already had, um, his mo mom would say, you already have Duke, get something else. And he would say, you know, you don't have to work with whatever it was. And that, that sparked me to say, you got to toyize what's going with the thing. It's, it's all about the width. So how do you sell a second Spider-Man? Yeah, I already got Spider-Man. Spider-Man comes with web shooter. Spider-Man comes with web blaster. Spider-Man comes with whatever. Um, but throughout my toy career, I've always asked for, but what's it with? Um, and that seems to drive multiple sales. You can always get the first sale. 
记忆。啊，也是。啊。But the second cell and the third cell really create a line that grows it and it is expansive, like the other jar. It's what's it with? What's it? How's it different from the one next to it? And that's how you create collections. And then you can come answers three years later. And conventions yeah. three years later. So the next thing we're going to show is being able to expand upon it is the sobering scepter. So there it is. Um, yeah, the, it's called the Inceptor. Oh, okay. Awesome. Good. Possibly it was called the Inceptor. Yeah, yeah. I was trying to remember. Anyway. Um, it was the Avenger, um, and we had actually created the name, so it should have been. Um, but it was going to be a coke vehicle. Um, it started out the bottom two right hand. Stop. It started out as that. And uh, the one in the center is actually a wooden and plastic model that I made. Um, that's a costing model. It's what we did for size and for first presentations, um, just to see and feel what it might be like. Um, and then we would go to find models. Um, the one just to the right of the one in the center is the was supposed to be the final model for that. Um, brought it to a presentation. And they said, mm, it's too Star Wars-y, can you make it more Star trek -y? <laughs> <laughs> So my attempt at more Star Trek-y, because I didn't quite get, the, get it exactly, was that longer, sleeker, rounder feel. Um, so that's that's where it was going to be produced. So we, we, have, we have toy fair models. We were, we were ready to roll with that thing, um, including engineering drawings. And uh, then we pulled it from the line. Of, uh, um, the, the line moved to Cincinnati, and Cincinnati chose to stop producing this kind of stuff. So these things, I, I'm not that familiar with these. The images were provided to us. So Kurt, did you design these by chance? No, I know what they are. So you want to talk about them a little bit? I, I'm not that familiar with these. No, the idea, sorry. The idea is if you look at the um, upper right, that's the old front, uh, count out figure, Frank Caronius, and the idea was that he would have uh, like a spine in the sky, like that, press the button, it would launch up um, the old roadblock mechanism. So we were trying to revisit it instead of reinventing the wheel. How do you make it a little more fun, a little more different? So the idea here was to try to take some old mechanisms we had and could we re repurpose them? Uh, a couple more, actually, plan more for vehicles. And again, you can see how once you try to put a, a vehicle item onto a figure, it gets clunky, bulky, it just doesn't work. But the, the, the thought was sound, but the figures were too small to pull this off. So everybody's favorite on the panel right now. Uh, one of my favorite uh, things that I you know I have focused on are the animals. I didn't think they're different. I know they're not what we see. I do it, but uh, I'll, I've always found them to be fun. Uh, Kurt has some great stories behind the. Uh, the design, why he created different things and incorporated different elements into the design as well, which you know you'll see I've written about. But uh, we're going to go through a couple of different slides here on the manimals. We'll show some of the wave one, some of the wave two, uh, some of the off the offsets as far as manimal encounters, um, the um, manimal um, hunters, hunters, manimal hunters. So at any point, jump jump on these guys. I talked a little bit about this earlier today. Yeah, so just kind of reiterating, the uh, design behind these were done mainly in meetings. Uh, again, it was a very big team effort. Uh, it was actually a fun line to work on because, I mean, they were unique, they were different. It, it just wasn't, to me, it just wasn't G.I. Joe, but I think the, de the detailing on these were a lot of fun. Yeah, and it all started with an inventor item that had come in um, that had the tip, tip it back and the mouth went and then the circuit came up. And then we had to create um, other ones that were based on that. So we had to work up a bunch of different mechanisms and these are the ones that sort of stuck. This, this is a good example though of, um, uh, of how we were trying to create, you know, someone earlier asked, you know, uh, where did the, uh, ideas for G.I. Joe come from? Did they come from the comic book 
from the TV series, or did they come from the toys? And this is a good example of uh, how we develop our own storylines internally. And the, the ultimate idea behind the animals was we had Star Brigade, and you can see that the packaging is reminiscent of Star Brigade. And well, who is Star Brigade going to fight? Well, yeah, they're going to fight Cobra in space, okay? But what if there's this invading horde of aliens from outer space that really are going to come over and take over both Cobra and G.I. Joe? And so this was an example of at least I'm trying to push the envelope in terms of how are we going to create our own storyline? And we never got there, but in my vision, um, you know, I almost could see Cobra and G.I. Joe uniting against this new evil force called Manimals. We just never got there. But, um, you know, that's just how we created our products at Hasbro. I mean, it was a, it was a truly, you know, creative process. We were, we were building the universe. We weren't letting Universal Studios build the universe for us. Yeah, and, and to build on that, anytime you design a toy, you think of a story. I mean, it's all about stories. Um, when I presented a, a vehicle, I didn't walk up and say, okay, this thing's gonna roll, it's gonna shoot three projectiles and you know, count, you know, 16 foot pegs. Um, it would be more like, can you imagine this thing rolling into battle? It has to fight Cobra, and these are the kinds of things coming at it. It's gonna take it out with the anti-aircraft missiles. Um, you know, 16 guys are gonna jump off, and you know, you'd, you'd create this little story, this little scenario, and people go, yeah, I can picture that. Um, so it was all about story, and so we were always talking about, yeah, you know, these guys could fight these guys, and this is how, um, I mean, the stun actually came from uh, a movie that I'd seen where there was vehicles on the beach, and they were sort of built in, and the vehicles coming in came and started to go around them and started attacking from the side, and the only one came in front. So I said, oh, stun, moves on the side, because these vehicles are going to, you know, come on the sides of the So now we can attack where it needs to attack. Um, so it's always a scenario you're picturing in your mind as you're creating these things. This is, a, this is a, an animal from Wave 2. What's interesting is you can see, this is Kurt Rhodes, but you can see the different elements that he's combining from you know, some preliminary and then combining the chest and then just the head and so forth. And then you, and we'll get to it in a minute, uh, there's some preliminary models that were made, but how whatever that thing is on the right where his head expanded and had this big giant mouth and something. Joe or possibly Cobra. So, you know, the thing that's interesting about the animal too is Cobra was their enemy as well. So they weren't just, you know, against Joe per se. But you can also see how the, the meshing of the figures, you didn't just do one design, you would do multiple designs and people would cut up your fit your drawings and put them together to make a, new, a different design. So it was, you had to do a lot of drawings just to get one figure out. So here's some other examples of Wave 2. Uh, I'll show some images of the eyeball guy in a minute, but uh, you know, a lot of this stuff you can find on the Ojo as well, so if you want to see uh, later on, you can kind of check these out. And there's the, the tarantula looking guy right there to the left. It's really a model of it. No. Yeah, go back to that just for a second. Um, just just so the, the, um, the, the web, the netting, you can see on there. Um, it was a fishnet stocking, and that was the leftover from. Um, um, don't go there. Don't go there. <laughs> <laughs> Should we go there? Then? Uh, the question is the audience. Can we believe the Joe, your mouse. Um, <laughs> it, it was actually used for Python Patrol. The first um, deco on Python Patrol was actually a fishnet I put over a, um, a hiss. Sprayed it once, then pulled it a little bit, sprayed it again. That's where we got the deco for the hiss and for the Python Patrol in general. And then that was transferred to different colors and stuff. But it was, yeah, fishnet stocking, and that was the leftovers from it. So who, who were they originally is the question? I, I wore those. <laughs> <laughs> so here you can see um, the one I showed here. You know, Kurt and I have talked about, like, how he talked earlier about he would draw a lot of these in meetings and sketching sketches. And what's funny is 
I don't have it on here, but there's all these like little notes from even other people. There's some notes from Billy Young on some of the manual things um, that I've seen or I have. And it's always fun to see you. These guys are just goofing off and having fun. And I think that's what it's about, is just having fun times and doing this concept. But if you look at animals, you can tell, them, for lack of a better word, I'm stealing from. So like, the Guanas, the original, was from Battlestar Galactica. You can tell them the Egyptian, the whole theory there, and this one, Planet of the Apes. So you're getting inspiration, but you know, might cheat steal your way through it. I just like this one. Yeah, I like this kind of Yeah, this was a more of a mantis look. And the idea was that the two claws were supposed to spring over, but the claw house, I think, the, uh, of that would have uh, really driven the price up. But this was, you know, starting to become more human again and then turning into the creature. And I think, you know, from my understanding, based on the concept, this would have functioned similar to the slider. Right. You know, it's sort of like Those are quite awesome. you can, But you can see the Egyptian look and feel. But he got out of control. Bill Young was sitting next to me a lot of times when I was sketching this one up. And had this, had that, had this. There's that, yeah. It just, it got overly so as, as I mentioned earlier, there's the video with the character Striker, and it's going to be the origins of the manimal. And um, sometime this weekend, uh, one thing some of us did at Hascon uh, late at night is myself, uh, Gray, Child, uh, Carson, we were sitting around just reading this manuscript, and we believe it's from the video. And it's just a lot of fun. So we're going to try to incorporate something here at JoeCon, so more details will come on that. But to me, it'll be a fun reading, potentially. Um, it kind of gives a synopsis of the, of the manimals leading into the replicators, which we'll touch upon in a moment. Um, this is the character uh, Thrasher. This is a two-pack that is expected to come out as well. Up next, we have the replicators. Want to expand on, on where you were going with this? I know. <laughs> so, once again, these figures were designed by Dave DeForge. Uh, he was taking them to the Joe Lines. This is a. Uh, he has several names War Dog by Hellhound. Yeah, he, he later became my Christmas. Not beat us. <laughs> and in that manuscript, you know, we, we when you first look at this, you probably think he's an, this evil creature. But um, within the manimals in, in this uh, uh, manuscript, sorry, um, there are some good manimals. And Hellhound was actually part of the, one of the pets, I guess, of one of the good manimals. Mm -hmm. So, even though he's vicious looking. The way he worked, though, was really cool. I don't know if he came up with the mechanism. But his, his mouth opened and expand and would grab the character and pull it in. And the head would come up, too. So, it, because of the way that Joe's work, he couldn't do this with a lot of figures, the way they could bend over, he'd pull it in and he would, he would just disappear into his mouth. Awesome. I believe it's his <laughs> head and hands hanging out. But, you know. and I believe this will be a de declassified boot. So you can check this out later. Replicators again. So it's one of the heads inside. Um, so this is the we define the packaging or for the minimal counter. So we talked a little bit about this last night. So Kurt, you want to expand upon where the concept or ideas came from? This? No. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I have no idea. Yeah, I know it was late last night. Oh, he, oh. he showed this to me last night, and I swear I was just like, where did that come from? My name's on it, but I barely remember drawing it. I remember the. Um, little guy with the arms that was based off the uh, Ghostbusters, the guy who ate the sausage, slime, and uh, combined with the alien, as you can tell, the guy and the lower guy, I have no idea where my mind was at that point, yeah. the late night. It was probably a, you know, yeah, he could have been. Yeah, um, but I, the idea was, I was just going to say the idea was they had to be small, they had to be compact, and they had to be something, I was told, that could hold on to the figure. So if you look at the way everything works, it can snap onto the figure. Right, and uh, it was going to be packaged in egg. At the time, Gap um, from Nickelodeon was big. Um, so we wanted to do some slime work. Um, 
we had already sort of failed putting slime in our uh, uh, eco warriors, so doing it again. Um, but yeah, that egg would break over and those eggs would be covered in slime and gag, and um, it would be attacking um, GI Joes. And the, the, the marketing influence here was Vinny Galeva. Um, Vinny was a huge Aliens fan, yeah. a big Aliens movie fan. So I think you can begin to see some of the you know presence of that in this whole small version of the line. <laughs> the chest would open up and then the alien would pop out as an alien saw earlier. And we pictured the kids putting slime right inside there too. Up next, our next X Soldier. X Soldiers was an outgrowth of, in the early 1990s, uh, 93, 92, comic books were like having an incredible renaissance. Um, comic book companies were springing up left and right. It wasn't just Marvel and DC. Image had come out. Valiant Comics oh, had come okay. out. Uh, there were a bunch of smaller independent companies coming out. And comic book stores exploded all over the place. <laughs> and uh, this was our attempt, again, to, you know, we're looking at the marketplace and we're saying, well, what's going on in the marketplace? And uh, superheroes were huge. So I remember putting a, a, a plan together, a document together, explaining that, which I gave to uh, Kurt in R&D. And these are some of Kurt's you know, interpretations of some of the characters that, and th this was my attempt at writing comic books. Um, not a great attempt, at, but this was my attempt. And uh, Kurt interpreted what I had come up with that would be uh, some of the designs you're seeing here. Yeah, actually, um, we started with, we wanted mechanized guys, so we started with mechanism, and then Kurt dressed the mechanisms to a degree. So we, Bill Young and I actually worked on mechanisms. So if you go back to the last one, um, there was a guy, and we were calling him CD Rom. <laughs> um, on the far left, basically any pose you put him in, because the wheels placement, he would really roll down the, down the floor. I mean, he would just scoot. Um, had something on the back of his head, on his feet, on his hips, um, and it, it moved. I took uh, Hot Wheels axles and put it onto him. <laughs> and that thing really, really moved. Um, the guy on the right was an underwater guy. We used the same mechanism that was in the submarine. So if you put him in the water, he would sort of sink and then slowly raise up and then sink and move forward. Um, so that was a working character as well. Um, the next one's, um, yeah, he's told him. The guy in the corner had the jet sound. Yeah, yeah, the jet, jet on the right, and um, <laughs> this this guy that has the blades on his wrist and sort of a skull head. Um, yeah, I like comic books as well. Um, I was told that you could never put, be able to put smoking, working smoking into a figure. That one's smoking out of his head. It had a little bellows in it back after you um, turned it on, hit the bellows and his whole head would start to smoke. And that's a basically three and a quarter of scale. But if you listen to what was just said, I, I whispered to Kurt, I love this line. I mean, we as a team, we that was really fun. got into it. We were excited to do this, being comic geeks, you know. Um, and it, you can see from the drawings, you can see from the mechanisms we were putting together, there was an energy here. And we thought he hit, you know, hit a home run. We were really into it. And, uh, this is one of the funnest lines I've worked on. Just from a collaboration standpoint, I see Ron's one of the number the most because wheeling that thing down the hallway and chasing it. Yeah. <laughs> it worked well. <laughs> so that wraps up uh, our panel. Um, I know we have a few moments or minutes for um, questions. So we can get a mic out there to some people. Yeah. 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 Just, just yell it out more. Yeah. Yell it out more. With the revenue. Uh, well, like, what was the story of the revenue? We know with Duke and Destro. Were they the aliens, aliens impersonating the actual uh, characters? Or were those characters just infected by the uh, aliens? And were they tied into Vanderbilt? Was there a great story?